Hello, um, and welcome to this session on Open Education Champions. So this is a chance to talk to important open education advocates and actors, um, which is why we're talking to um, my colleague today, Antonio Martinez Arboleda. Um, so the intent is for students, teachers, pedagogues and practitioners of open education, like, um, like you, Antonio, to discuss the importance of open education and to share your experiences um, facilitating the creation of more open educational resources and to inspire others to do the same, um, especially from the context of, I know you're not a librarian, but uh, in terms of my role in the library here at the University of Leeds. So my name is Nick, Nick Shepherd. Uh, I'm from the University of Leeds. Uh, I work in the library at the University of Leeds. Uh, my job title is Open Research Advisor, um, but I also have a background in open educational resources, which is how I know um, Antonio. Uh, we go back quite a way, don't we, Antonio, about uh, t 10 or more years. So, uh, yeah, very pleased to welcome you today, Antonio. Um, if you perhaps uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your experience with open educational resources. Um, hi, Nick. Thank you very much to you and thank you very much to Spark uh, for this kind invitation um, to interview me. Um, I have been involved in open educational resources for probably 13, 14 years already. And um, currently um, I am academic lead for open educational practice at the University of Leeds. Um, and as part of our digital transformation uh, agenda, um, I'm involved in a number of projects, including OER, but not only OER. And um, yes, I, I remember very fondly when, when I started with uh, open educational resources uh, back in probably 2008, something like that. And um, one of my first experiences was uh, with the Humbox, a repository of open educational resources for arts and humanities. And this was part of a, of a big plan uh, to support uh, individual subjects within the higher education sector in the UK to have their own repositories and to create their own sharing communities. And uh, the Homebox, um, the repository that I was supporting, uh, I was in the team uh, that contributed to the development of the, of the project as a whole, uh, was amazing, actually. It was a truly amazing experience we have we, we still have a lot of resources in that repository. People still upload resources there. And uh, it was one of the success stories of, uh, of uh, sharing as part of that bigger project for all the subject centers. Unfortunately, subject centers, um, people who are familiar with the higher, higher education system in the UK will remember them. They, they were defunded, they were, um, the government withdrew the support for them. So that had a knock-on effect in a number of things, including the sustainability of these repositories. And then other, <clears throat> sadly, we have seen uh, over the years, some uh, de-investment uh, mm -hmm. from, from governments into open education resources infrastructure. And it, it's problematic. It's problematic because, um, it sends the wrong signal also to institutions. And um, there are many things in education and in general in society that do not lend themselves to invisible magic hands of the free market, you know, to actually, yeah, yeah. To actually fix them. Um, so I have to say that uh, although this was a, a beautiful story of how to promote sharing and we had a lot of uh, academics sharing mm, uh, resources there, uh, the lack of support um, made it, you know, somehow to be uh, to be forgotten, mm -hmm. mm, to be and, forgotten. And, and, and now, because um, obviously you and I are both at the University of Leeds, so how is the University of Leeds in particular sort of working with open education now in lieu of those, as you say, the, the national infrastructure perhaps um, not as well supported, but what about a university like Leeds? What, what, what are we doing in that area? Yeah, yeah, we're doing a lot of things actually. I'm, I'm very proud to be involved in, in the open education resources 
initiatives we are leading. Um, but uh, it requires a little bit of detail. Yeah, this answer is not easy, Nick, um, because of the absence of a, a proper national repository of open education resources, institutions have to consider, you know, whether to participate in other institutional repositories or create their own. What is a repository for? Um, do we need one repository for each institution? Uh, what type of repositories? And, and uh, we've, we've been working actually with lots of uh, uh, colleagues in the library, a mm -hmm. uh, lot of colleagues in the library at the University of Leeds, uh, including yourself, um, to propose uh, a referatory, you know, a, a, a website that would um, um, embed links from our internal repository to open educational resources that mm -hmm. were to be, are being published either by our digital education services or by any colleague or institute within the, within the, within the, um, within the institution. So we are working on that. There is a very solid uh, project. Um, we had a working group. We have a, a model. Mm -hmm. We know what we want that to look like, the functionalities, etc., and uh, it's part of our it's part of our digital transformation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so I, I like to, you know, um, I'm aware that many of you there that are watching us may be librarians. Uh, I have to say that you know, without your involvement, these open education resources, um, services, ideas would be impossible because librarians are in charge of organizing mm -hmm. organizing knowledge mm -hmm. and, and and on that note sorry to interrupt um, no, no. Tony, Tony but on that note I suppose um obviously from a library perspective because I'm um obviously based in the library um in particular focused on open research so I just wondered if you might comment on how um some of the other areas that we work in in the library might feed into open education so obviously we're talking open research so we we have a research data repository we have an open access repository of research publications so they're not oer um, necessarily or are they are they open are they examples of open educational resources or or not well <laughs> um they are and they are not it depends on how you want to look at it in my my remit uh, um institutionally is open educational resources and that is conceived as uh, materials, learning ma materials that are produced with the intention to using them for teaching. Mm -hmm. So it's always a very dodgy differentiation because, you know, if you produce an academic article, is that article actually not being, you know, produced with the purpose also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be taught? Mm -hmm. yeah. so that students can read the academic article. So it's a, it's a complicated mm -hmm. differentiation because it, the idea of what is the main purpose of this resource, um, you know, there are different objectives mm -hmm. uh, when somebody shares, produces and shares knowledge, you know, it may be that you share because you want to communicate with your research community but it may be that you also, you know, have in mind potential students who may want to access to those resources. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. and I, I like to, you know, for me, um, the difference between research outputs and learning and teaching outputs is not that clear cut. And uh, But if we want to draw a line, if we want to draw a line, I would say that the translation into uh, different media, different products of research papers, for instance, imagine that I have a research paper on open education and then uh, it is an academic article, it's not really accessible to everybody. If I take that article and produce uh, a video explaining some of the ideas to make it accessible to mm. a wide range of audiences, then that research spin-off should definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. be considered yeah a, a um, open educational resource and actually teaching 
teaching material. Yeah, yeah. And, and is there just on the, the last point on that, is there, a, I guess, a relationship between you know, the fact that those types of materials or the research and the data need to be openly licensed themselves so that they can be used to create those, those open educational resources as well? Of course, of course, if you don't have open education resources for the research output, it's very difficult uh, legally uh, and ethically to create those uh, learning and teaching resources that come straight from uh, research output. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's crucial, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I wondered then if you might just say a little bit um, about uh, how, you know, who, who has benefited, would you say, from open education at our institution at the University of Leeds, but also um, beyond Leeds. Yeah. Um, you know, well, what, what, are, what, are the key, what are the key benefits for, for us as an institution and for, um, uh, you know, global colleagues? Yeah. Benefit from our research and, and open Well, I, I have a practical example um, to illustrate the benefits of open educational resources, which I'll comment in a minute. But before that, I'd like to say that Sometimes it feels that um, we have been um, developing a culture of open education resources um, for the last nearly 20 years um, without much result. If you, if you go to your average academic and ask, do you share open education resources? Uh, do you do it regularly? Do you actually engage in a constructive, um, well, it, it, do you engage in, in building knowledge collaboratively? Uh, the answer um, for a majority of people perhaps is no or very little. So it may feel that we have failed. It may feel like that, but actually in the last 20 years, we have created uh, a lot of research Mm, about open education resources and open education, open practice. We have created infrastructures. We have uh, designed uh, all sorts of uh, protocols on what to do and how to do it. And uh, we have Creative Commons licenses, mm, which is instrumental uh, for open education. And um, we just have the infrastructure uh, the human capital uh, ready uh, for a time like this now in 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 the 2020s mm, in which uh, a number of uh, transformations are taking place uh, that are going to be um, led by openness mm. so in a way i would say that one of the big achievements of the oer movement um, and i like to call it a movement academic activists uh, is that we have laid the, laid the, laid the foundations mm, for what is coming now, what is going to happen and is happening. Um, so uh, yeah, in terms of specific benefits for specific colleagues, I think we still mm, to see uh, the book mm, of change of transformation. Mm, and um, I, I like to think also a, a cultural transformation. So when it comes to sharing, uh, I like to differentiate between uh, targeted sharing, the sharing that you do because you know that there are people on the other side of the repository who are going to be using your resources, who are interested in reusing them, repurposing them. And then the, the other type of sharing, which is the sharing to a generic audience, um, that may or may not um, lead to actual reuse um, uh, by uh, learners and teachers across the world. Things that you post on a repository without knowing where they're going. I think it's very important that we differentiate between these two types of sharing. Why? Because I have seen that um, uh, many colleagues are not really keen on simply putting things up without knowing whether there is a real need for it, whether they are going to have students and teachers who are going to reuse it. Whereas the opposite occurs when uh, you have a specific demand, a specific need, when you have a community, when you 
when you are aware of a, a community of learners or any other type of community who you know, or they have told you, they have told you that they would benefit from you publishing the results immediately, the love for sharing uh, comes up and uh, transforms attitudes, transforms beliefs about sharing and um, the magic happens. And uh, this is what, what has happened in particular with, uh, with a project that some of my colleagues here at Leeds uh, are involved. Uh, we are doing targeted sharing, sharing um, for other colleagues in other universities uh, that you know they have contacts with um, to be able to um, repurpose the uh, resources that we are producing, uh, adding uh, things to the resources that we produce, mm, a sort of co-creation, collaborative creation, and use them for specific purposes for courses that they have in conjunction with, with, other, with other institutions. So um, that makes people feel enthusiastic about sharing. And the key here is that despite the fact that you know that those resources are for a specific audience that is asking you to share uh, with them and you, you know them and they are part of your community, et cetera, that when you share, actually you do it openly for the rest of humanity and you do it with infrastructure, uh, within, the, within an infrastructure, uh, a repository in this case, that allows uh, dissemination, mm -hmm. that allows, uh, you know, reuse yeah. by anybody else in the world. Yeah, so, no, thank you. I mean, um, you've already touched on this a little bit um, as we've been talking, but um, I mean, what, what do you see as the key successes of open education so far and I suppose the other side of that you know what still needs to be done for for open education to really take hold you've already, you know, obviously you've already talked about infrastructure but you know what have we what have we succeeded in so far and what have we still got to do well um the normalization of creative commons licenses that you go to youtube or you go to Flickr and you have an option in big platforms um to use a Creative Commons license, I think it's a massive achievement that has not really uh, been celebrated loud enough. Um, people understand that there are other ways of sharing apart from the traditional licenses and uh, academics are more familiar with the licenses. That's a massive step. Platforms um, recognizing those licenses, academics understanding that there are uh, those opportunities for sharing in a certain way. Um, the relatively top-down and still, you know, necessary um, step to have open access for research assets. Mm -hmm. That is crucial as well. And um, obviously having an infrastructure and human capital of expertise within librarians and academics on open educational resources. The big bulk of academic research on this area is tremendous. What does it need to be done? Um, I think we need to understand better how and why people share. Uh, we need to understand the reasons why uh, people share or not share there are a lot of studies about this, a lot of sociological research, there are interviews. But um, I, I, I think uh, we need to start to consider again uh, the, um, the activity of sharing mm, from square one. Do not think, do not think about sharing OER, think about sharing resources, sharing them publicly, whether it is um, with a Creative Commons license or whether it is in a different way, mm, whether it is in a repository that has been created by an institution or is um, shared, you know, through more conventional uh, means. Mm -hmm. why, why academics share to audiences that are generic, without having a specific request to share by potential users. 
And if mm -hmm. we understand, and if we understand sharing as a phenomenon, uh, independently of what type of sharing it is, I think we will be able to understand better what the steps need to be taken uh, to foster um, or your sharing and to eliminate barriers. Yeah, yeah. And um, again, you've already alluded a little bit to to some of this, but what, you know, what are your not 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 just your plans, but what are our plans as an institution, and what are your plans as a as a pedagogue um, in in the open education space? You know, what's next for you and for for the University of Leeds? Well, there are there are specific windows of opportunity actually uh, that I think we we have to we have to uh, make use of. Uh, one of them is podcasting. Mm -hmm. I think podcasting has become something cool. Uh, colleagues, academics, many academics understand the value of podcasting uh, because it is fashionable and uh, you can see you know, easily how a podcast can be, uh, can be making a difference uh, in people's lives, um, how you can adapt uh, your uh, understanding of your subject, how can you adapt it to wider audiences through the means and the communicative strategies, etc., the style of the podcast. And obviously, uh, as an institution, apart from promoting uh, podcasting, supporting podcasting with the adequate infrastructure uh, and training, we need to make sure that those podcasts have an option for Creative Commons licenses when people publish them. Mm -hmm. So um, this can be a really good sandpit for sharing, um, taking advantage of this uh, fashion, this wave of you know, initiatives around podcast, mm -hmm. because we need a, a change of culture um, and we need uh, little big steps mm, in, mm. in the direction of sharing more. And um, it may sound a bit opportunistic, mm, but why not? Mm? Yeah. If, if colleagues mm, are you know, amenable to podcasting, let's do podcast. But now that we have the knowledge, the infrastructure uh, and the research about openness, let's make sure that the majority of them, obviously giving an option to uh, to producers of podcast uh, authors, let's make sure that they can be part of our OER. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think you're right. I mean, I listen to loads of podcasts. I don't think that perhaps the pandemic's been instrumental of that, in that lately as well. And this, they're so easy to listen to, aren't they? In the car or on a walk, or if you're out on a run or whatever. Um, so uh, we've had quite a broad ranging conversation, uh, Antonio. Is, is, is there anything we've missed? Do you think anything else you'd like to add? Um, Our institution, the University of Leeds, is um, committed to the um, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and other institutions across the world have a similar commitment. For us to achieve uh, these goals, we need more education. We need greater presence of educational materials, educational contributions, research, within our society. Uh, if, we, if we want to tackle these goals, uh, we need that knowledge, uh, that education to be open. If it is not open, we will fail. Yeah. In my future work as academic, I'm interested in um, finding the relationship between the work of uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, the French sociologist, one of the most influential thinkers of the last uh, 50 years and attitudes uh, towards digital engagement and in particular attitudes towards sharing. I think that there can be, you know, very uh, solid mm, scientific explanations uh, to some of, the, some of the conundrums that we uh, deal with um, in, uh, in, in education and in higher education. Why are academics not sharing mm, always? Uh, why do we have these barriers? And uh, Pierre Bourdieu provides uh, in his uh, theoretical framework with uh, a lot of uh, 
categories, a lot of concepts that uh, can be explored and should be explored to find these explanations, in particular, the, the concept of habitus. I've been reading recently about the influence of habitus in um, the dispositions, mm, the actual dispositions of uh, German teachers when it comes to digital uh, learning engagement. And uh, also another study from the Maldives University uh, in the Maldives, in which uh, the cultural habitus, the educational habitus um, uh, of the, uh, and the educational, uh, the technological habitus of the, of the teachers is taken into account to somehow predict mm, or understand uh, the social significance of their teaching style and digital engagement uh, with teaching as well, what type of tools they use. So I think it's a, it's a valid, it's a valid theoretical framework to explore the phenomenon of sharing. And it will help us to understand specifically, uh, if you read these two articles, I can give you later the, the, uh, the references. Uh, if you read two article, these two articles, you, you'll see you know, that the type of explanations that we can uh, get with the application of this theoretical framework are not there yet in the vast literature that we have about sharing and you know attitudes by by academics uh, when it comes to OER. If we if we need to look at the question of openness um, from a global perspective, um, long term, we need to consider things like having media media groups, you know, big corporations, big companies involved in sharing uh, knowledge, sharing uh, resources produced by universities. We, I think we need to look for partnerships uh, with televisions or with newspaper groups so that they can also be a channel, a channel of distribution um, to facilitate engagement with audiences of all that valuable knowledge that is being produced. That is an area that hasn't been explored and is something that um, I'm very enthusiastic about. Think about this. Imagine, imagine a newspaper, online newspaper, having a section uh, dedicated to uh, educational resources, topics to do with research, um, a sort of journalism inspired in um, research and educational materials. You know, the sharing of those materials, the sharing of that open scholarship. You know. Mm -hmm. should, should actually blend within within the work that these media groups you know yeah, yeah. carry and, out in terms of engaging yeah and is there a relationship there with social media would you say i mean what's the what's the role of social media in in, in this space there are there is i like the work of mark carrigan mm -hmm. uh, who is an expert in social media is the, the biggest expert in social media for academics and um, you know one of the things that um, he, he presents a lot of caveats, you know, for social media for academics. And I, you know, I, I agree with uh, many of the things that he says, actually. Um, I think academics do not, do not like, in my experience, yeah, in my experience, uh, do not like simply, you know, to go on Twitter and start pressing share, 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 and, you know, tweet, 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 the number of the beast, yeah, sorry for mm -hmm. the heavy metal pun, yeah? Uh, they, 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 don't, they don't like, and a majority of people, not only academics, they don't like simply to take the, the fruits of their work, yeah? And just put them out there randomly uh, because, because they can see easily that um, perhaps you, you get three, four likes and one comment, uh, and it could be demoralizing and you feel that, why am I, sharing all this. So the important thing about social media is having a community, an underlying community of people that you know, people that are interested in your work, a community that you perhaps build somewhere else, not necessarily on Twitter, and then use Twitter to share with them and with others because yeah. you can put use hashtags strategically and there are many things that you can do to maximize the engagement of your tweets mm? 
and uh, but make sure that you are tweeting for somebody who you know appreciates what you are going to say and that is going to find it useful and that, um, that you are part of a community and that you know social media is the means mm? because that engagement is is the foundation of whatever comes later which is um, social media fame you know big audiences people who who um, from other parts of the world you never met interested in your work and that is uh, and i have to make a warning about this the majority of uh, of people who who tweet never reach um will never reach this status of uh, social media um social media stars and and that's the way it is and uh, no matter how good your tweets are uh, there is an element there of look and engineering um that makes um somebody to become you know a social media star i don't think academics should try to aspire to that because it is um first of all it is impossible that we are we all are stars you know it is impossible that everybody has millions and millions of followers and millions and millions of likes and engagement you know activities mm -hmm. that is impossible so we need to understand that it is a possibility, mm -hmm. uh, but it should not obsess people because really the quality of what you say in Twitter has nothing to do with what uh, the number of likes. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Antonio. A, a really interesting conversation. Good to talk to you. It's uh, great. Hopefully, we can see you each other in person uh, at some point. Um, you know, um, we have seen each other since the pandemic haven't we all during the pandemic but it's uh, yeah. obviously it's, it's still uh, difficult when everybody's working at home yeah. Uh, but yeah really look forward to uh, sharing this with the open education community and uh, i'm sure you'd be happy for people to get in touch with you on twitter or elsewhere yeah definitely uh, to, to discuss um open education further so yeah thank you very much and thank uh, you thank you nick and thank you uh, my colleagues in spark uh, yeah, thank for you to this spark. interview yeah, yeah.